I'm really excited to be, I've been invited to be part of this panel on rethinking pelvic pain because that, that's what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> we need to really start afresh because we've been going in the wrong direction for most of my career. Um, I can only make the analogy to the children's story, The Emperor with No Clothes, where all the townspeople follow the em naked emperor through the city, praising him on his beautiful costume when he's naked. And that's essentially what we've been doing in the pelvic pain world for the majority of my career. Um, <clears throat> your logic chronic pain syndromes, for the most part, are not organ-based, and yet we've spent our time blaming the prostate and the bladder, researching the prostate and the bladder, and treating the prostate and the bladder, and we have, for the most part, been unsuccessful. Why did we go so wrong? We started with some very attractive theories, some good ideas, one of them, glomerulations, are a hallmark of interstitial cystitis, the early form. Chronic bacterial prostatitis is a primary cause of pelvic pain syndrome. It's just that the bacteria are hard to culture, they're hidden in the prostate, and the antibiotics don't get to them very easily. And these theories were adopted and taught as if they were fact. And unfortunately, it turns out not to be true. This is one of the very important papers. It was a beautiful paper, 1978, from Tom Stamey and Ed Messing, with the quote, <clears throat> we believe that the finding of glomerulations is the hallmark of interstitial cystitis. Unfortunately, not true. And 10 years later, that became adopted into the national NIH research and criteria, which then de facto became the diagnostic criteria. Glomerulations were part of the diagnosis. And now, 40 years after Stamey, 30 years after NIH, we have a meta-analysis showing there is no convincing evidence that glomerulations should be included in the diagnosis or phenotyping of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. So if we're going to be heroes, and if we're going to get to useful answers, the first thing we have to do is admit our error and stop going in the wrong direction. And I'm going to apologize for the role that I played earlier in my career in sending people in the wrong direction and repeating the things I'd been taught, because we now see they're not true. I was a decade behind my partner, Dr. Potts, in recognizing many of these truths. But we have to now start off saying, what do we know, if anything, and not keep repeating the things that are wrong? Otherwise, we'll continue to waste money on research that's not meaningful, and we will fail to communicate in a useful manner. If we cannot communicate with each other, with our patients, with the funders who might give some of their scarce money for us to do more research, and with the scientists who might provide the breakthroughs that would help us understand things, then you know, we will never make progress. So we have to be accurate in what we know and what we don't know. <clears throat> and I wish that we could just make this a nice recipe. Here's what you do to take care of the pelvic pain patient and diagnose and treat them, nice algorithm, but it's also not going to be like that. What do we know about the patient today? I think it's fair enough to say there is a small cadre of organ-based disease. There is real interstitial cystitis, ulcerative IC, Hunter lesion disease, whatever name we want to give that. And there is chronic bacterial prostatitis. I believe we actually diagnosed a patient in the last year. Very uncommon, but it does exist. But the vast majority of patients with urologic chronic pel pelvic pain syndromes <clears throat> 
do not have organ-based disease, and the name a pelvic pain syndrome is not to give a diagnosis. It's simply to describe the symptoms. It is a description of a syndrome. So we can say ulcerative interstitial cystitis, that's a disease. You don't need a urology fellowship to look at that and say that looks bad. It, there's something wrong there. <clears throat> but when we put ulcerative interstitial cystitis with bladder pain, we, everything falls apart. This is one of my favorite studies from 2007 when a group of expert pathologists went back to look at the biopsies from the original IC database study. They used the most modern uh, histopathologic techniques, defined their outcomes in advance, and then used a computer to analyze all the results to find clinically meaningful groups within this spectrum. So out of 200 patients, you basically had 24, a little over 10%, that almost certainly have bladder ulcers. That's the kind of findings that they had. But the other 90% had no pathologic abnormality. None. So you just think about that for a second. No pathologic abnormality. 39 different histologic criteria, expert pathologist, and yet we've spent our time calling this a chronic inflammatory disease of the bladder. And they cannot find anything wrong with the bladder. And it's not really different in the male pelvic pain world. You know, this was the, the NIH cohort study published in 2002-2003. The rate of positive cultures of semen or prostatic secretions in the men who were diagnosed with chronic prostatitis is exactly the same as the rate of infection in normal healthy controls. Exactly the same. Not an infectious disease. And when you look then at the ne next paper, uh, which was uh, the white cell count, there were small differences, statistically significant differences, where there were more white cells in the cases than in the controls. But again, chronic prostitutes versus normal control, small difference in white cell count, not saying it's a chronic inflammatory disease. And despite that, and despite a black box warning on Cipro, we still have men getting saying, oh, you have a chronic in prostate infection takes six weeks of Cipro. So we have a lot of rethinking to do, and we've got terrific panelists here to lead us on our rethinking. Um, we're going to talk about the urologic chronic pelvic pain syndromes. And as I alluded to, a syndrome is simply a medical signs and symptoms. It's not a specific disease. They're correlated with each other. And what we have to do is break these apart and look at the patients and find phenotypes, find things that we can lay our hands on, look at, test, and treat, and see if the response to treatment um, leads to success. It's a long road, but we're going to have two talks now to start us down. First, Dr. Elise Day, then Dr. Jeanette Potts. We're going to ask you to hold your questions until those two talks, then we'll have some Q&A and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Argoff's talk.